a line to the fucking fullest with me. And that puts my mind in another zone. That's what that puts my mind in another zone. For Lord, I swear to God, that puts my mind in another zone. Where it's like, like the way we're going is so, so downhill. I, I just look at you like, you know what? She's almost just another fucking human being. And she's almost like, to me, the way she's doing me, like, especially with that red and shit, she's just almost like, nigga, she's like headquarters, yo. Like, well, Lord, you're almost on that level of fucking, I'm gonna be like, yo, you're headquarters to me. And then just move off of that. Whatever my impulse is off of that, is like, okay, you're a motherfucking nigga to me. You're nothing to me, though. This is what's going on in Dennis Munoz's head at 7.30. When he's in a van with Edwin Velasquez, somewhere between downtown and the crime scene, his mind was in another zone. Which brings us to Kayla. Kayla sees, as she said, and as we've talked about a number of times, the van, well, there's the van. It's 7.30 in November. We might, we might forgive Kayla for calling this van old in the street light at night. Point is, she saw an old minivan, like Edwin's, with a noisy engine, like Edwin's, make a U-turn in front of Michael Black's house. the house of the person Wolf had said many times that he would kill. It's not a coincidence that at that time, Mike's distinctive work van was parked outside that house, right where the U-turn took place. It parked around the corner, near no other house, or not directly in front of any other house. It's not a coincidence that one of those men it's not a coincidence that only two men are seen. It's not a coincidence that one of those men popped the hood to the van, as Edwin admitted that he had to do regularly due to his overheating engine. And it's not a coincidence that the other man walked in the direction of the victim's home. The same home where the same victim identified Wolf as his killer just a few minutes later. Nobody's that unlucky for this to all be a big coincidence. <clears throat> At 7.33, Mike sends his last text. Again, you'll have these documents, you'll have these records. The shooting happened between 7.33, that last text, and 7.38, when the 911 call is placed. <coughs> he sends the text at 7.33, and then he takes out the trash. And we know what happens from there. Defense counsel was pretty convinced and wanted to stick with the idea that the shooting happened at 7.30. Sticking to Hector Garcia's, I'm going to say, estimate of when the shooting happened. And we heard from Beverly, who pretty much just remembers that it was dark out, Hector said that it was around 7.30. He also said, you'll recall, that just a few minutes later, the police arrived. <coughs> so if the police didn't arrive until 7.43, 7.30 is way too early for that. But also, he never said that he referred to any clock or anything like that. Who did refer to a clock? Shannon did. The uh, EMT who was here. She apparently took note that the shot happened at or about 7.36. We didn't hear any mention of that from counsel. It doesn't matter. You believe Shannon, don't believe Shannon. The shooting happened between 7.33 and 7.38. A time frame when those two guys are not anywhere else, and in fact had recently been somewhere very near uh, um, between downtown and this location. At 7.38, Mike calls 911. Hold on, sir. I just seen a shot. Okay, who shot you? 
I'm not sure what's on the Indian Wolf. Okay, do you know who shot you? I had my kids, yes. Okay, where have you been where have you been shot? I'm hurt Sir, sure, I got that. Where are you shot on your body? In the back. In the back. Please hurry. Okay, sir, what is your name? My name is Michael Black. Okay. And you do you have a description of the person that shot you? Yes, I know exactly who it is. Who is it? His name is Wolf. What's his first name? What's his first name? Yes. Sir. No. What? Sir. No, get me. Okay. All right. Stay on the line with me, sir. I'm going to have help on the way. Defense counsel wants us to believe that that's a guy who's so high that he's incapable of identifying the person who shot. Now, Mike was shot in the chest with an exit wound out the back. That doesn't seem to be disputed. So he was facing his killer. Dr. Shaw told us that when the bullet accelerates through the body, that it pushes the blood out the back. And it's reasonable to think that in that moment, he knew that he was bleeding out of his back a lot, and that's what he said. You heard no testimony suggest that the amount of meth that he took was in any way going to make him hallucinate or make him skip time or whatever's been suggested and say something that isn't true. Daddy came in and he opened the door really fast and then he went and he wanted us in his room for a little bit so the bad guy couldn't get us. He had the consciousness of mind to come in the house, secure his kids, dial 911, tell them as much as he could about what happened, grab a sword from God knows where, uh, just in case the person was coming inside, and enough sense to say, please hurry. He knew that he was in the last moments of his life. <clears throat> You're going to see photographs, all the ones that we went over in, in court. And take as much time as you like with those ones from the kitchen in the hallway. I believe you'll see that there's a bunch of stuff that looked like it probably was on the refrigerator, kids' pictures, kids' drawings, and an exercise document that says, let's get moving. And that's the stuff that's on the floor. So with all the, the characters that we met and that we talked about in this trial, and all the gossipy stuff and the sex and drugs, it's kind of easy to forget that 10, 11 days ago, this case started with the victim himself telling you who shot him. This is a man identifying his own killer. This is a man in the last moments of his life with no reason a lot. Um, the kids talk about a flashlight. And we know, because we heard some testimony from Beverly Bowman, that the police used flashlights when they were approaching the home. And it's possible that the kids were thinking about that, but maybe not. Maybe the killer did have a flashlight. No flashlight was found in Edwin Velasquez's van. No flashlight was at least collected, if not found, in Dennis Munoz's home. You know where a flashlight was found? It was found in Dennis Munoz's pocket the day after the murder. Dennis had an iPhone 5. Any iPhone that's been out in the past several years has a flashlight on it that's pretty much going to be just as strong, if not stronger, than the old plastic ones with D batteries that I grew up with. Now when this is happening, let's talk about Mike Robinson. What's he doing at the time that an old minivan with a really loud overheating engine is parking around the corner from the victim's house? What's Mike Robinson doing at the time that Mike Black is calling 911 and telling them, Wolf shot me? He's dope sick. He's trying to score. There's some Suboxone to keep the withdrawals away. 
make it his way, and you'll have all these within the jury room, ultimately, to the house. We heard a lot of talk about Mike Robinson this morning, and I disagree with some of the characterizations of the evidence that you heard. But it's not my characterization, it's not their characterization that matters, it's, it's your interpretation of it, it's your decision uh, what to do with that information. I do not believe you heard testimony that Wolf confronted Mike Robinson about sexting between him and Courtney. There was some sort of confrontation and apparently it ended okay. <coughs> You didn't hear any testimony about sex. You did not hear testimony that Michael Robinson said that he could walk or ride his bike to Elmhurst in five minutes. <clears throat> That's not true. He said that from his house um, in, on Calvert, Calhoun, that he could make it to Farragut on his bike, and I believe he said that was about a mile away. I don't even know if he gave us a time. Um, Mike was shown a map. And Mike identified the general location of Farragut, the general location of Calvert or Calhoun, and the general location of the Cloverleaf neighborhood. And here's Farragut in the library in the old courthouse. I believe he identified Calvert or Calhoun as one of these blocks. I think up here is the police station. And then again, Way up here is Clover. We heard the word affair used a lot in regards to Mike Black and uh, uh, Kelly. No witness ever referred to it that way. Seems like Kelly and Mike Robinson uh, broke up um, for a number of reasons, and during their separation, at some point, Kelly and, and Mike Black hooked up for a couple weeks. Multiple people, well, I'll say this, nobody said that they had a problem with each other at the time of the murder. And multiple people talked about how they would see them together and see them laughing and joking about the ex that they both had in common. This is another instance, and we saw this a lot this morning, where the defense seems to pick and choose which parts of which witnesses they want you to believe. They don't want you to believe that Mike Robinson is telling you the truth on just about anything because he's a drug addict and he's a felon and a good old boy. They don't want you to believe anything he says except for that part, of course, where he said, I don't have an alibi. That part they like. And I like that part too. Decisions about witness credibility are entirely yours. What could be more credible than a person, three years after a homicide, being questioned about that homicide, coming into the police station and saying, I don't have an alibi? What could be more credible than a person who says that and, in fact, does have an alibi? Due to the text messages and coming and scoring dope that night. <clears throat> In a bunch of instances, the defense only wanted to show you certain texts. <coughs> You'll have the opportunity to see the full context. Remember, there was the, the line of texting about uh, that started with this sort of on, ominous text from Michael Robinson, right? Who did you F? And the suggestion was that he was, he was angry and jealous. But a couple minutes before, we see where this all started. And then they didn't show it to th this part to Courtney. They didn't show it to Mike. So on cross or redirect, I had to show it to both of them. It's going to be the same thing in evidence, too. Defense exhibit doesn't have this on it. You'll have it when you look at Courtney and Mike's uh, full time on. So this is where this all starts. It's her volunteering this information and saying, again, consistent with her testimony, that they didn't even have sex, but they had, I guess, some kind of intimate interaction. Maybe not a big deal. 
But I think the point is that the defense is grasping at straws to try to put this on Michael Robinson. He's a man whose own child was in the care of the Munoz family for a time. He's a man who has now gotten himself sober and is, in turn, raising Wolf's son. So would that happen if anybody really believed that he framed Dennis Munoz for murder? Dennis Munoz was all over Courtney, was all over her phone, was all over the men that she uh, was involved with. And as you have seen, and will continue to see, all of his anger is focused on Mike Black. Dennis Munoz doesn't have a problem with Mike Robinson. Do you know how we know that? Because he said so. In this letter that you'll see, no problems with Keith, Dolores, or Mike Robinson. That was in October of 2018. Michael Robinson did not kill anybody. Dennis Munoz killed Michael Black. He did it between 7.33 and 7.38, and he did it with the help of Edwin Velasquez. This whole timeline that we just went through, establishing the motive, the threats, the opportunity, it all supports that basic proposition that we started with, that this case is about a man who said he was going to kill somebody, and then with the help of his cousin, he killed that person. But like I said last week in the opening statements, a person can confess to a crime without ever actually saying, I did it. So the next part of the timeline focuses on the behavior and the actions of the defendants after the murder. So our 911 call of that 738, Wolf's first use of the phone between 730, after 730 is 812. So at 7.30, he's somewhere between downtown and the crime scene. By 8.12, he's back in the Galloway, Epsecan kind of area. And what's he doing? Who is he Googling? The crime reporter. Then who's he calling after midnight? The hospital. Star 67, so they don't know who's calling. This is where we get to an important part. Ms. Marquez said that at 1.30, that phone call, that Wolf didn't know that Mike was dead. And that's 100% true. He didn't know. And why didn't he know? Because after he shot him, he didn't drop down on the ground. He ran away, ran back inside the house. So overnight, <coughs> Dennis Munoz had a real big problem. He had just shot somebody square in the chest, and the guy ran away. So he's calling Courtney and fishing for information. He's looking up the, the crime news for the local crime news, and he's actually calling the hospital and trying to hide his number off star 69. Two different hospitals he calls. He's panicking. This is a big, big problem for Wolf. If Mike survived, he was going to identify Wolf, which means that they must have seen each other. If he survived, he was going to identify Wolf, maybe testify against him along with his snitching rat wife, Courtney. And then Mike was going to do that thing that Keith relayed to us that Mike said he would do. Raise Wolf's kids in his own, while Wolf went away for attempted murder. This is what's going through the defendant's mind that night, and his behavior shows it. He's calling Courtney dozens of times over the course of that night. And finally, she talks to him at 1.38. If he's not my friend, nigga, he knew me, he talked to me, and I told him. Like, I told him twice in the conversation, like, let the fuck go. But obviously, y'all think she's sweet. Like, yo, y'all think shit's sweet, but like, you can do this to Wolf. Okay. Well, take what you want to take. Why? Because just take what you want to take. But right, here we go. I think I'm playing around. Okay, I'm, I'm playing. I'm playing. Playing. Playing around. Yep, I'm playing. And I'm something to play with. Yep, I'm soft. I'm something to play with. You really got to take up soft. Like, my fucking wife, dude, who knows me, like, you think I'm soft? So 
suggested by the defense that maybe he was talking about somebody else. Maybe he doesn't have a problem with Mike Black. Um, almost every other morning you test that dude that you're talking to. I don't even want to say his fucking name. It's not worth it to me. Say his motherfucking name. He, it, you say it all the fucking time, Dad. Oh, oh, Mike Black, motherfucker. Come on, man. Okay. Well, I text him every morning. No, I don't. Okay, well, you text him a lot. But you text him no, this I don't. morning. You text him this morning. So, like, go ahead with that shit. You text him at 8. Again, he can see her text. He can see her calls. He can see her try to get in contact with him at 1038. We know that doesn't go through. We know Mike is deceased by then. But Courtney doesn't know that. And Dennis doesn't know that. Uh, and so again, he goes from a little bit of bragging. You'll see. You'll see how soft I am. But he's also panicked. Especially when he thinks that the police came to the Wycliffe's residence and about this. Then he really goes into overdrive, calling Courtney and calling her over the night. Texting her this at 2.51. What else is he doing over the course of the night? Looking up Mike Black's company. What else is he doing? Talking to Allison about getting some sort of profile picture finding out about somebody's wife to see if she's pretty enough for, to push up on, and then laughing that he ain't no blood. And again, calling Courtney and calling her until 7.40 a.m., the recorded call that you hear when Wolf, for the first time all night, gets some really good news. Listen, uh, your friend got shot yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And what are they saying about that? Who? What's he saying about that? Who's Your friend. I don't know. Mike, you talked to him. No, I haven't. You haven't? No, I haven't. Oh. Thinks that she talked to him from that 1038 call thinks that he might still be alive because he saw him run away after he shot him. Oh, he, he, he's not dead, is he? He's not dead. He's dead. Is, yes. is he for real? Yes, he is. Oh, okay. Wow. You can hear his literal sigh of relief. He's been worried that there's going to be a witness out there all night that's going to finger him for this attempt to murder. Now he's dead. The call ends, his 18 minute call ends at 7.58, and he immediately calls Edwin, among other people. Good news, the guy died. No need to worry about anybody snitching. Remember, remember what he told um, Tom Fine and, and Christine Cooker after the interview was over. He said, I know for a fact there were no witnesses. This is what he's talking about. The person that he thought was the only witness, or the only witness he thought was dead. Listen. And he's so happy, so overjoyed that Mike Black is dead that he praises God about it. Okay, he gets off the phone with Courtney at um, 7.58, Calls, has a phone conversation, calls Edwin immediately, within like two or three minutes, finally connects with him at 8.09, and sends him this text at 8.39. Since I prayed and asked Allah, King of Kings, for what I wanted, I truly know he's the best planner. See how I forgot my phone and had to double back? That decided everything. It worked out completely for the better. He's not talking about trying to get a ride here. Mike's death is the thing that he prayed for. Not just because he deserved to die because he was hooking up with his, his estranged wife, but because Mike stood up to him. Mike was not scared of Wolf, and he said so. Mike was also the reason, apparently, that Wolf might not be getting his pills anymore. He was the reason that he couldn't control Courtney anymore. 